What I want to do in this video is give ourselves a framework for thinking about the rent versus buy decision for a home. And the key takeaway I hope you have after this video is there's not just a simple right answer that it's always better to rent or that it's always better to buy. For full disclosure, I own a house and I bought it for a whole series of reasons, some of them emotional, some of them potentially economic. But there's and but it, it depends on your personal context, where you are in your life, and what part of the world you live in, and what the economy is doing at that moment, what rents are versus what housing prices are. And hopefully this video will give you a framework for at least how to think about them. So let's say this house is on the market and it's on the market for a rental at $1,500 a month. So $1,500 per month, which is the same thing as $18,000 a year. $18,000 a year. So that's one option that you have. And let's say there's an identical neighboring house that's on the market for sale. And you are in a position to buy it. Let's say that house is $400,000 is the price that you can get it at. You don't have $400,000, so you're going to have to borrow some money. You've saved, you've saved $100,000 for your down payment. $100,000 down payment. Down payment. And so you're going to have to take the remainder out as a loan. So you're going to take out a $300,000 $300, loan. Now, a traditional mortgage, one that has a fixed term, maybe it's a 15-year fixed mortgage or a 30-year fixed mortgage, it's your, your, every month you pay your, your mortgage bill and some of it goes to, in a traditional mortgage, some of it goes towards the loan and some of it goes to, or some of it goes to pay down the interest and the rest of it will go down to pay down the loan. So for example, let's say that your mortgage payment is 1800 1800 per month. Early on, it might be disproportionately interest. It might be, say, 1500 a month in interest and $300 to actually pay down your loan, to actually pay down this $300,000 loan. And then as that loan is paid down, near the end of the term of your mortgage, it might have gone the other way where each month you're paying much more to pay down your loan, maybe by that point it's 1500 And the interest, since you're, it's interest on a lower amount by that much because you've paid down the loan so much, your interest might be lower. So this would be kind of a traditional process of, of a traditional mortgage. But to simplify our analysis, I'll assume that you're taking an interest-only loan, a loan where you're only required to pay the interest portion of it, and you could pay down your loan as you want to. So let's say that this is interest only. This is going to help just simplify things. And obviously, if we want to get really detailed, we'd probably have to get a spreadsheet out to really analyze things and see how the interest and the uh, how the interest payment changes as we go through the life of the loan. But let's assume it's interest only at six percent, six percent interest. Interest only at six percent interest. And so that means on an annual basis, you're going to pay eighteen thousand in interest. Eighteen thousand in interest. 6% of 300,000, 18,000 in interest. Now, depending where you live and what your income level is, in a lot of places, you can deduct, you can deduct mortgage interest from your income. And so this doesn't mean that you get all of the 18,000 back. This is saying if you're making 100,000 a year, instead of paying, say, 30% on 100,000, you're now going to pay your taxes on 100,000 minus 18,000. So it'll your your taxable income would go down to 82,000. And so you'll save roughly your tax rate as a percentage of this. So let's say you save roughly a third of this on reduced taxes. So that's reduced taxes. And so your effective interest that you're paying after the tax break, let's say it's $12,000. $12,000 is out of pocket or the effective effective cost of interest. Cost of interest. And we're not done. We know that there are things there's there are costs of home ownership. You'll have to pay usually some type of property tax. Let's say it's 1% property tax, 1% of 400,000 would be 4,000 4, in property tax. Property tax. And you, of course, have to upkeep the house. Maybe you have, maybe you're, you, you have a gardener. Maybe you, maybe you have to repair things. You get 
things painted, who knows what it might be. These are things that you, you usually would not have to pay if you're renting. And so let's say, although it might be different, once again, depending on the situation, let's say there's 2,000 a year, 2,000 per year in upkeep, in upkeep. Now, the reason why I listed all of these things, and obviously we could go into more depth and more detail and think about other things and, and that are more particular to different circumstances, but this is a list in, in either of these cases are the things that are essentially are, are going out the door. If you're renting that $18,000 a year, that's just going out the door. That's, that's, that's the, the, what you have to pay for the benefit of living in this house. If you buy the things that are just going out the door, are your effective cost of interest, your property tax, your upkeep. And so this will all, uh, this will all add up to, let's see, 4,000 plus 2,000 is 6,000 plus 12,000 is 18,000. 18,000. So just like that, it looks like our annual costs that are just going out the door, given the assumptions. In every different circumstance, you're going to have different assumptions. So this is just a framework. Your, what's going out the door, what's going out the door is $18,000 a year in either case. But we are not done yet. In this case, we didn't talk about what we're doing with our $100,000. Over here, we had to use it for a down payment. Over here, we still have $100,000 invested. $100,000 invested. So we're going to get some income from this $100,000 that we wouldn't have gotten here. And it depends what we're doing with it. If we have it in a really safe bank account, maybe we're getting 1% or 2%. But maybe we're investing it in a portfolio of things and getting 4% or who knows what, what, what we're doing here. But we need to think about what we could have gotten from that down payment, from that from investing this incremental money. So let's just say, for the sake of argument, that you get a 2% return at 2% annual annual return so you're getting $2000 $2000 in investment income investment income from that $100,000 so your actual out of pocket if you were to net your you net your your income benefit that you didn't have to or the the investment return that you didn't have to use up on the down payment that netted against your rent now you're 16,000 now you're 16,000 out of pocket 16,000 cost per year. Now, the way that I rigged the numbers for this video, it turns out that for this individual, purely on the economics, purely for this year, as we'll talk about in a few seconds, things might change in the ensuing years. But purely for this year, if we can assume these numbers, it actually might make sense to rent a house. And of course, this, this, this analysis completely changes depending on how these numbers change. If this house were cheaper, if you got lower interest, whatever it might be, now all of a sudden this number might look better. If the rent was a lot higher, this number would look similarly would not look as good. If your return on investing weren't that good, this number would this number would be higher and it would not it would not look as good. So the key thing to realize is is just Try to analyze what your actual out-of-pocket costs are. And one might one, one say, well, look, you know, just psychologically, when I'm doing this mortgage, at least it's forcing me, it's forcing me to save. And that's true. It is kind of a forced saving that's happening here. But in but in theory, you could do it here. The equivalent amount that you would have paid for interest or the, the interest portion of your loan, that's your rent. And above and beyond that, you could just save that $300 a month and put it into your investment pool. And after 30 years, you might very well have a good amount of money there collecting a lot of or generating a lot of income. So there's no very clear cut answer that renting is always better than buying or that buying is always better than renting. It really depends on the circumstances. This is a back of the envelope version. In future videos, we'll do a more in-depth version. But the other things that we should think about beyond just the numbers are the intangibles. And so let's just think about those in a second. Let's think about the intangibles that favor renting and the intangibles that favor buying. So the biggest reason, and this is why we bought a house a few years ago, is for buying their stability. There is stability. You might get a great deal on a rental and the owner takes care of it and it's in a great neighborhood, but maybe they want to rent it out to someone else or maybe they want to, uh, may maybe they want to move into the house themselves and then you've got to move. If you buy a house, as long as you pay the mortgage or you pay off the house now, pay, pay off the house eventually, you're pretty much, and you can pay the, and you, you can pay the property taxes and things, you're pretty much guaranteed that you can stay there. Another reason that you might want to buy is rents are unpredictable. Rents could go up. Rents could 
go up. If you're in a really rapidly rental appreciating market, say someplace like Manhattan or San Francisco, it's nice to be able to say, well, look, I got a fixed mortgage payment. This is what I got to pay. Once I pay this thing down, I don't have to worry about the craziness of what rents might do because the economy is because so many people want to live wherever, wherever your, your house might be. And then another thing, and once again, this isn't an exhaustive list, is that you can customize and you can make improvements. Back when my family was renting, I can't tell you how many places we saw that looked really nice if they just changed this bathroom a little bit or if they just changed that kitchen a little bit or if they did not paint that one wall yellow. And so when you buy a house, you can make those same improvements. But all the intangibles aren't just on the buying side. They can also be on the rental side. If you're just settling down in an area and you want to figure out the lay of the land, you might not want to commit to one neighborhood or one house without understanding things better. And so you might want to have the flexibility. Flexibility of renting. To keep buying and selling houses, there's a lot of costs involved, especially when it, the, the cost of, of the brokerage fees and whatnot. And so you might like the flexibility. You get into a six-month lease, one-year lease. Once you understand things, then you might want to buy a house or then you might want to rent in another neighborhood. And as we saw earlier in the, in the kind of 2003 to 2008 period, sometimes you have housing bubbles and sometimes these economics go way out of whack and housing is just overpriced. Housing overpriced relative relative to housing is overpriced relative to rent. So once again, big takeaway, it all depends on the context, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of a framework for thinking about the rent versus buy decision.